just by way of introduction, uh, I, my name is Peter Zanzo. <laughs> you may have noted in uh, what was put on minds that I'm a third generation socialist. My mother, who was born in Germany, was a socialist, and her father was a socialist. So this has come down from the 1800s to now. And I mention that because you may find my perspective somewhat idiosyncratic. Uh, but I think I can sustain my arguments and my position. Dorothea and I, I think most of you know Dorothea. Dorothea <laughs> and I came to Boston uh, to organize at Harvard and at Boston University. That stems from the fact that we had recently organized Columbia University and had initiated organization at New York University. So we were, we came here um, to organize essentially in universities and nonprofit institutions. What I want to talk about today is the current state of the labor movement whether unions are still relevant, and if they are, what is the role of progressive with respect to the labor movement? I would argue that the labor movement is relevant. It's in unfortunate shape, but it is the major institution that has brought about social change in this country over the uh, last century. And it still retains the potential for affecting further change if it finds its way. Unfortunately, labor movement, as all of you know, I think, has shrunk, is in bad shape. In 1950, taking that as a base year, approximately one-third of working people were members of unions. As of 2012, 12% of the workforce is unionized, and only 7% of that 12 is in the private sector. We see what is happening to the economy and standards of living currently. There is growing inequality. Unemployment, if we look at the real unemployment figure, which includes those who have stopped looking for work, uh, because of discouragement. And those who work part-time but need and would like to work full something, we really have an unemployment rate of about 18%. There have been losses in purchasing power, gains in wages and working conditions uh, have not occurred. And we haven't seen anything in, re in recent years. Plants are closing and or relocating. Those that are not going overseas are moving south to take advantage of non-union and anti-union attitudes that are found in parts of the South. And we've seen also growing tensions between unions, some of which are at war with one another. And we've seen scapegoating of immigrants as though they are responsible for unemployment and other ills. 
You know, what has happened? What led to this state of affairs? Well, there are a number of reasons. The McCarthy period, I think, is of critical importance in the decline of the labor movements, although the loss in numbers doesn't really stem from the McCarthy period. A major problem, in a sense, the union, which again was about a third of the workforce in the 40s and 50s, I think signed its own death warrant in that same period while it was growing and flourishing. It entered into a series of understandings that inevitably led to its destruction. Its cooperation with and buying into imperial foreign policy was another important factor in its decline, and its failure to vigorously resist NAFTA and CAFTA, that is the North American Free Trade Agreement, now the Central American Free Trade Agreement. We are about to see two more free trade agreements, one with Colombia and one with, that will encompass both Mexico and Canada as part of a free trade zone. All of these have contributed to the decline in union membership. But of particular importance is the movement of jobs overseas. And that occurred Unfortunately, with very little protest initially from the labor movement, and very little effort to hold legislation and tax policies which encouraged industries to move overseas. Now, when I speak of the McCarthy period, being critically important to what has happened to the labor movement. I'm really talking about what is essentially the theme of what I want to discuss today. And again, that is where the progressives fit into the labor movement. The McCarthy period, which much of the labor movement bought into, resulted in driving from the union movement the most militant, most committed members of the labor movement. Whether they were members of the Communist Party or Socialist Party or any other left group, they were hounded and driven from the labor movement. And they were the ones who gave the labor movement its real backbone. They were the ones who essentially built the modern labor movement. Since then, we've had a development within the labor movement in which unions essentially are benign dictatorships. Many of them have presidents or offices who have been in office for long periods of time who see unions almost as their personal property. <coughs> who have even, though some of them claim progressive credentials, people who see themselves as the fonts of all wisdom, who know what is good for members, 
and if necessary, will shove it down the members' throats. The great loss in the labor movement, although it was very strong, and my thesis is that we have a membership and have had almost from the outset a membership which really does not understand the economy in which they work, in which they are employed. That's very understandable. If I'm a menswear salesman in Macy's, it's a little difficult for me to understand my relationship to a worker in a Hormel meatpacking plant in Iowa. There is a relationship, and we like to say an injury to one is an injury to all. But working in Macy's, I don't know why an injury to this worker at Hormel injures me in any way. Those things have never really been dealt with in the labor movement. And what we have today is a sort of further ossification of union leaderships and unions operating in ways that make little or no sense. I refer to the labor movement fatally injuring itself in the 40s and 50s when Walter Ruther and Lane Kirkland and others in effect a adopted a policy which conceded to management the unlimited right to manage as long as workers got a piece of the pie. That was a fatal error for the labor movement. Perhaps it was an honest error, I don't know. I wasn't privy to those understanding, perhaps because the end of the Second World War was the point at which we became the greatest nation on earth. Uh, Great Britain, which had been the greatest nation on earth, had suffered terribly in the war. We, our industrial capacity, had not been damaged. Europe's and Japan's, of course, had been totally devastated. And we were in this wonderful period of full employment, rising wages and benefits, in many cases managements which hardly even quarreled with unions, <coughs> but were almost happy to hand out increases because business was so good. And it's possible that some of these union leader, leaders thought that this would go on forever. If they did, it's because they had no understanding of the capitalist system. Mm. And that, again, was a fatal error that was made. And we have a sort of perpetuation of that error today in much of the labor movement. We still have these, this ossified leadership in most unions, presidents and staffs who have been in office for years, there is no understanding that the president of the union and other employees of the union are employees of the membership. They are not independent entities. Members pay dues, and it's from those dues that presidents and others get their salaries and their benefits. We are in effect, and I was a vice president of the union, we are the employees of the membership. 
it's not really the formal employer-employee relationship. It's more intimate than that. But nonetheless, the boss is the membership, not the staff. That's been lost. It's been forgotten. And in many instances, it was never understood. Certainly the union, which Dorothea and I come from, District 65, which was, which no longer exists, but which was a basically New York, New Jersey based union of some 30,000 members, had this marvelous, progressive beginning and history, which increasingly was watered down as this mentality of the wise leader who could make no mistakes persisted. We have, when Lane Kirkland in 1995, lost an election for the FLCIO, and Sweeney from the SEIU, from SEIU was elected. There were, with loud hussars, the claim that this was a new day, and in fact, this new leadership adopted the phrase, the new voice. This was going to be a major change within the labor movement. Well, the new voice never worked. Nobody really tried to make it work. And we then had the new unity partnership. That was the next great step forward. To a large extent, that New Unity Partnership was engineered by SEIU, the Service Employees International Union. And the strange thing about this New Unity, Unity Partnership is who it included. Several unions banded together, the argument being that they were paying too much per capita to the AFL-CIO, that money should be used to organize workers. That was pretty much the program, nothing much more than organizing more people as though that would solve problems. What was very peculiar about this is that this group involved the Laborers' Union, the uh, Carpenters' Union, Unite. It's an odd grouping, particularly with the Laborers' Union, which has a very ugly history of corruption and racketeering and connections to organized crime. Now, what was SEIU doing with the laborers' union. It's an oddity. Again, that vehicle succeeded in accomplishing very little. The only union that did any real organizing was SEIU. And largely in the New England area and the West Coast. So a new organization had to be developed. And the next one was called Chance to Win. In this case, SEIU, the Teamsters, the United Food and Commercial Workers, <coughs> again, the peculiarity that we have unions which are notoriously corrupt working jointly with SEIU. What can SEIU have been thinking about? Now, I focus on SEIU because much of these initiatives come from SEIU.
they, as a grouping, none of, none of these groups, incidentally, exist today. None of them have succeeded in accomplishing anything. Now, compounding the problems in the labor movement in general is the peculiarity that the labor movement in the United States actually almost alone in the entire industrial world has no real connection to a political entity that represents its interests. It may well be that the Socialist Party, the Labour Party in Britain, is not much of a Labour Party at all. <laughs> and some of the Socialist Parties in continental Europe are sort of capitalist socialists, if there was such an animal. <laughs> But there nevertheless was some political connection. The connections that developed here were with the Democratic Party, by and large. And the Democratic Party, I think all of us understand, is the left wing of the capitalist system. So the labor movement has bought into capitalism. And the result has been the fact that the labor movement has been supine in its political attitude because clearly it could have exerted great power if you go back a few elections, if the labor movement had said to the Democratic Party, since they were married to it, we will not support the Democratic Party unless we are given specific guarantees that could have been effective. Because had the labor movement affected from its support, it's in all probability the Democratic Party would have lost an election. They never, however, chose to do that. Part of that, I believe, is a part of this ossifying tendency within the labor movement. It's not only great to be the guru, to be the Jesus of a particular union, but to hobnob with presidents and senators and other important people is pretty wonderful, and it's awfully hard to give that up. And so we've had increasingly, as we as we've seen, increasing corporate control of the United States, of its politics, and of its institutions. And it's a very interesting type of control. It's unique almost, in that we've brought psychology and PR very much into uh, this matter of exercising, of controlling the public. One of the things that impresses me is that I keep hearing politicians and labor leaders talking about the middle class. <laughs> I don't know who the middle class is. <laughs> I have no idea. First of all, no one has, has defined this middle class. I don't know what makes it middle. Apparently, if you earn $40,000 a year, you're in the middle compared to Berkshire Hathaway. I have no idea, but we bought it. And the labor movement has bought it. I hear labor leaders talking about the middle class. So I guess if you work at McDonald's, you're middle class. The working class is now gone. But that's a very, very clever ploy. Because any notion of class warfare is out now. No such thing as class warfare. We're all part of one wonderful, great power, whatever we are. We're not working class anymore, we're middle class now. 
And we find we have been sold the bill of goods over and over and over again. We've been sold the bill of goods in a variety of, of ways and in ways which the labor movement doesn't and never did address. Because we are oppressed and exploited as producers but the other side of that is that we are oppressed and exploited as consumers. And that relationship between these two has never really been addressed by the labor movement. Its concern has been what happens on the job, as though there are no other concerns. Now, essentially, what I'm saying is that the great failure of the labor movement has been its failure to educate. Because that is a primary role, needs to be a primary role of any labor organization in enabling workers to use their own strength to understand what their strength is and to understand the system in which they work so that shocks are understandable, so that they know what is happening and they know how and where and when to resist. Of course, if we do that to any great extent, those people in leadership may feel themselves threatened by an overly militant membership. But it's that militant membership that is needed to build and create. Now, from there, I want to go to the years that Dorothea and I were involved with District 65. I joined District 65 in 1952. I moved from California to New York City. And people I met told me about this absolutely remarkable institution and so I got a job in a 65 shop. And it was, in fact, a very remarkable institution, unlike, I think, any other labor union that has existed in this country. 65 occupied and owned a 10-story building, all of which was occupied by the union. And there were various things occurring. There was a, a bank from which members could make loans at, at extremely low rates of interest. There was an optical service. Members could come and have glasses made essentially at cost. There was a dental clinic. There were legal resources available for members who had problems. There was a whole range of these services. And most of all, this peculiarity that there was no dues check-off. <coughs> members had to pay dues individually, and the only way you could do that was you had to come to the union because the first floor of the union was a financial office. You came there and you paid your dues. And you did that because you were issued a union book. I have an old copy of one here. This was a union book. And when you paid your dues, it was entered in the book. And at the same time, Normally, you came and paid your dues on the day that there was a membership meeting. And so when you attended the meeting, the book was stamped so that you would avoid paying a dollar a fine the next time you paid your dues. Now, the brilliance of all of this, and the founder of the union, who I unfortunately had died before I joined the union, so I didn't know him. He clearly was well to the left 
politically. But all of these things were a means of bringing members to the union. And there was an actual union attendance rate of over 90 percent, which is extraordinary. But the point was to have members running the union. Interesting concept, but a very wonderful left idea at the time. Now, unfortunately, this man who was primarily responsible, Arthur Osmond, had died by the time I joined the union. And a new president appeared. And somehow he succumbed slowly but surely to the same disease. <laughs> He uh, apparently began to believe that he had some divine sanction for what he did. He knew what was good for everyone. But within that framework, some of the things I discovered when I joined the union <clears throat> is a union which was very clearly a very diverse union. It was very much to the point that workers of color become a, an integral part of the union, and they were in fact about 40% at the time I joined. About 40% of the membership consisted of people of color. One of the oddities, though, that I noticed slowly, it took me a while to become aware of what really existed, is I went to work in one of the largest shops in the Union, a shop that had about 1,200 employees. And I worked in the shipping department, and there were numerous grievances in the shop, but there was no shop steward. No one wanted to be shop steward. And there was no what would have been chief steward because nobody wanted that job either. I had some background in the labor movement though. I had been a member of the National Marriage during the war. And while I was going to college, I was a member of the Longshoremen's Union, Harry Bridges Union. So I was a member of unions which at the time were left. Job Curran, the head of the National Maritime Union, was widely known as Red Curran, partly because of his hair and partly because of his <laughs> politics. <laughs> And everyone knew that Harry Bridges was well to the left. So after being in the shop about six months, uh, and being rather outspoken, partly because I was still pretty young and not too smart, I was urged to become steward, and I accepted. And I was, in fact, a very militant steward and began quite successfully organizing workers into groupings that would make their voice heard within the shop. In addition to that, I was busy in a neighborhood that was largely uh, industrial and largely non-union, so I would get busy in lunch hour talking to other workers and organizing shops. So after about a year in the shop, I was asked to come on the union staff because the union wasn't doing very much in terms of organizing new members. And they apparently thought I would fit in. Well, being on the staff, there were things I noticed, however, and that is that the representation of people of color in the administrative, in the organizing staff, the grievance handling staff, was quite small. There were no women in that part of the union at all. 
And I began to have some questions about what the union was like. Apparently, it was slowly sort of shifting away, drifting away from its founder's vision. But there were other problems that I saw. And I began to look at some of these problems and to find ways in conjunction with members by building relationships with members, particularly in the section of the union to which I was attached, and looking for ways to involve the membership directly. We were the only union in the United States which directly participated in freedom writing. There were unions that endorsed Kane and endorsed the programs for civil rights. But we were the only union that directly participated and that various of these rides we made into the South, there were as many as a hundred members participating. And many of these members were people who had never been active in anything in their lives, who had very little political understanding. But this was a means of helping to educate them as to what role they could play in their own lives and in American life. In addition, we looked for other avenues that affected members. We initiated in around 1962, I think, language guaranteeing rights of gay workers, very specifically uh, and joining any kind of discrimination against workers who were gay. We initiated language dealing with sexual harassment because that was an issue in some of our shops. The interesting thing about these changes, changes in contract language, some of which the leadership didn't like at all, Particularly, they disliked any reference to gays in contracts. In fact, at one point, I had, since by now, since virtually all of the new organizations taking place involves me and my group, I now had a team of five or six people who were on staff who were involved in organizing. At one point, we brought on staff an openly gay young man as an organizer. It was very, very upsetting to the leadership. Uh, it presented, they told me, a picture of the union that would be very damaging. But we had built within the union enough of a base so that they couldn't change that. Now at one point Dorothea came into the union. She took a job in a situation in which all of the employees in a given job category were white. And these were, and she thinks it's funny. <laughs> because I never told anybody I had models before. So. <laughs> we represented a number of chain stores, like I don't know if Learners exists anymore. That was one of the chains, <clears throat> and a number of other similar chains of primarily women's clothing stores. We represented the warehouses, clericals, their functions in all of these cases, they were based in New York City. And one of the things we discovered was that all of the models, and they employed what are called 
set models as opposed to other types of models. Fit models are not six feet tall, and they weigh more than 90 pounds. They are supposed to be reasonably tall, like 5'7", five, 5'8", five, and be size 6, maybe even size 8, and their role was to model for buyers the garments that manufacturers brought in and were trying to sell. So, of course, they were all white in all of these shops, and we decided we were going to end this. And we recruited Dorothea, who was intrigued by what we were trying to do, and took a job, and we recruited Dorothea because she was absolutely perfect. There was no way they could find a uh, reason for not hiring her. So they had to swallow it. And that, of course, broke open this all-white uh, situation. But also within the movement, within the union, Dorothea became very much involved in the activities of people of color within the union. And by now, the union had regressed pretty badly. The membership attendance was not nearly 90%. It was wonderful if it was 50%. In some instances, there were hardly even membership meetings at all. But there was still a group within the union that chafed at what the union had become and was becoming. And they had, within the union, what they called the Negro Affairs Committee, which did nothing at all, except meet occasionally and party, I gather, but nothing much. And Dorothea helped organize a group of people of color to take over the committee, to change it to the Black Affairs Committee, That's and to begin to play a very militant role within the union in advocating for a greater voice for people of color. I'm sorry. What year was that about? What? That would have been what year? It was around 1970. Yeah, around 1970. 1968. Now I'm pointing these things out about language, contract language, about participation in civil rights and other activities, about workers of color taking over a essentially non-functional committee, because it illustrates what I think, or it leads to, what I think is the appropriate role of the left. The left, I believe, belongs in the labor movement, not outside criticizing, but in it, and organizing within it. I've seen in the last 10 or 12 years, I've read numerous articles and a few books talking about the plight of the labor movement and its difficulties. And I see over and over again a conclusion the author reaches that the labor movement has to move to the left. Wonderful. I'm not sure I know what a move to the left means. Does that mean physical activity? Does it mean making bold statements? Um, I really don't know what it means. But I do know that I agree the labor movement has to move to the left. And there's only one way that will happen. To address the leaders 
leadership groups within the labor movement and say you have to move left to the left is, uh, seems to me, a waste of time. It's not going to happen. There's no way it will happen. What we might get on the part of some people, particularly from this egocentric and SEIU, um, are some wonderful statements, but nothing more. The reality is, and I think this is true everywhere in the left and in the labor movement, change does not come from the top. It comes from the bottom. And what needs to happen is the kind of thing that I talked about in 65. That bottom needs to be organized. And it's really not difficult to do. You know, an interesting thing, when we organized the new shop, my group, the education process began. One of the things that someone I spoke to who works at Harvard found extraordinary is that in most cases, we didn't go to the labor board to have election. We struck. We went into the employer, we said, your workers are members of the union, recognize them, and sign an agreement. And of course, in most cases, initially at least, we were refused. And so we struck. We did not go to the labor board. That strike was the, the beginning of a process of education. We were saying to workers, we don't have to go to a labor board, we don't have to go to a governmental agency and ask for help. We have the power to accomplish what we want. Now, interestingly, also, in the process of negotiating, as we drew demands and involved all of the members of a given shop, we also enhanced this process of education. One question I love to ask was sort of casually in conversation, is what is he best like? And inevitably, I got always the same answer. He's a miserable bastard. <laughs> He's a cheap son of a bitch. And so when we talked a little while, I would make the point, I would ask some of them, where did you work before this place? Well, and so and so, well, what was that box like? Oh, he was a cheap actor. <laughs> and so I was able to make the point that all bosses are miserable bastards. That's what this system requires of them. It may be that at home and in their neighborhood, they're wonderful people. But capitalism requires them to be miserable, cheap bastards. And so there's the beginning of an understanding of their role, that it isn't your boss, it's a system which creates these conditions and maintains these conditions. And there are, along the way, many, many, many opportunities to help workers understand. You can even talk in a very, very attenuated, simple way about the labor theory of value. And workers will understand the failure of the labor movement to educate workers in this way, to help workers understand who they are what the society in which they live is really like leads to this weakness in the labor movement. Because again, I don't know what relationship I have to a hog butcher in Kansas City. Doesn't mean anything to me. And when I'm told that NAFTA is a bad thing, I don't really know what that's about. I don't understand the system. We need this process of education, and so my point, and I, I will wrap it up, is that if you are not a member of a labor movement, you need to become one. 
and you need to organize at the bottom and help people see who they really are and what they are capable of. And that will make real change, not only in the, in the labor movement, not only can we revive the labor movement, but we can hopefully create an army that will make even more important change nationally and politically than that. Okay? Thank you. Well, thank you, Peter. Well, this has taught me a lesson, is check out what people are going to say before they say it. Because I never told anybody here, ever, <laughs> that I was a model or someone. <laughs> but anyway, I think that this was a very interesting talk, and it was uh, apropos to what we're going through right now. Um, the labor movement, such as it exists, is, I don't know if it mimics the left or the left mimics the labor movement, but I think a lot of things have happened, that things have kind of, um, what was they saying, kind of like a fizzling, they're not out, you know, the embers are there, so we just have to spark them more. But I just wanted, before we enter the questions and discussions, I just would like to let you know that um, Peter's talk was possible, it was sponsored by the Mass Global Action, the Howard Zinn Memorial Lecture Series, which was also responsible for videotaping this event, and the Downtown Workers Center, of which I am one of the coordinators. And a lot of what Peter was saying reminds me of the reason why we um, founded, started the Downtown Workers Center, um, because we wanted to be worker-run and uh, owned by, by workers. And we've taken it a little further and gone into the high school because we know that students do not remain students forever. That's number one. Number two, because of today's economy, or yesterday's economy that continues today and promises to be there tomorrow, younger and younger people are joining the workforce. And it's very sad to watch uh, young students trying to maintain you know, their academic um, averages while worried about how you know food is going to be put on the table and, and the roof is going to stay over their heads. They have two parents, maybe they have one. Maybe all the siblings and all the people that are helping to raise them are working because they have to in order to maintain the middle class, of course. Um, you know, and with all of this employment going on or uh, the lack of employment because you know, some of these uh, the salaries are not really livable. And still, we're not able to pay for the education of the children. And I happen to be working at a high school where the children are excelling, the students are excelling. I mean, the GP averages are definitely college. And they, and they apply to universities, and they get the letters. And it breaks my heart every single time. And I think about it, I get emotional, because I think about the times when I was a teenager, and I was told that because I was black, Latina, and a woman, that I didn't have this great matter here to be able to attend college and that a lot of struggles, you know, were fought. Blood was spilled and lives were lost so that we could do that. And that today, while the old Jim Crow laws are dead, this newly reinvented Jim Crow is a son of a bitch and it's a bigger killer. Because we're being teased on one end that we can do these things Right? Because now we have a job and we earn $8 an hour, and in some cases less, we're middle class. So while people grapple with that, como se llama eso, label, we're still dying of hunger, lack of health care, and, and a lack of nutrition and, and housing. Right? So the, the workforce is getting younger and younger and getting more abused and more exploited because the typical story that we have right here in this downtown area where we are is that they will hire five young high school students in order not to hire one full-time person that they don't have to give um, if their benefits to. And if they're 15 minutes late, they can make that up because, see, this supervisor is so wonderful. They're not going to fire this young person for being 15 minutes late because they know that they work well and they like them. So all they have to do is come in and work an extra hour. No pay. And they will not lose their job. And this is not a made-up story. Okay? So more and more students, if you look, the next time you go downtown, you know this little tidbit, 
Look to see who's waiting on you in CVS and Wendy's and, and uh, Walgreens and, and Macy's to stop people. And the racism continues because now we don't have to prove that the, the racist is a racist. Now you have to prove, I have to prove that someone is being racist to me. So there's a lot of work to still be done. And I'm telling you this about Downtown Working Center because some of the things that Peter talked about is the very, very um, principles that we're, we're establishing in the Downtown Working Center. So I'm not going to talk any more about it, but I hope that you are going to support it and that you're going to ask questions and we'll be back to some more talks. Um, I look around the room and I see some of the people that we work together to organize right here in Boston, some of the shops. And one of the shops happens to be was one of those classic things that they make movies and write books about. And it's in the legal journals. We have Mark, Steve, Nancy. We have people here that are living proof of how a fight needs to be fought and how we know we own the unions, right? And how we can tell that leader that was there, you know, growing glue on his ass to the chair because he was there too long. We can tell him, hey, we don't need you. We know our strength. We are the strength. Because we're the ones that bring those pigs to their knees when we strike. We're the ones that make the wealth, and how dare they keep stepping on our throat with their boots. So even if you have a progressive union, sometimes the leadership is somewhere else while we're still struggling and fighting for the same things. And the bullshit about no strike, get rid of that. We have to get rid of that. Are we going to get rid of it? Yes. yes. Are we? I don't believe you. Come on, we're going to get rid of it. Yes. yes. That's our strength. That's our weapon, people. That's our weapon. And so we're going to open the floor for questions, comments, or discussions. And I end everything that I always say with all power to the people. And we would like you to please, please don't leave here without filling, without giving us your inv invitation. I mean, don't say something. I'm trying to put everything too fast. One second. Ah. All right. Invitations to other talks and to also participate. And right now we're in this small space because we're in transition. We were in a larger space, and if you want to know the story about that, you know, later when we're socializing, we can talk about it. But we're in transition right here, right now. And we're hoping that within two years or so, we'll, we'll be able to move into a much larger space that we can maybe have a long-term lease, like 10, 20 years, or perhaps purchase our own space. But we don't have to worry about who come, whether the landlord is concerned about who's coming through our doors and who's leaving and what the politics of what we're doing are. Because we are the people. And we control our destiny and our future. And we've already proven that a landlord is not going to stop us. Didn't we prove that? There are people sitting right here to help make this move. Isn't that true? Yes. Ah, you sound like you're asleep. Is it true? Yes. All right. The floor is open. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Peter, I, I appreciated uh, everything that you said, but... <coughs> I've had the impression that the problem with the labor movement that, that you uh, said it uh, came about during the 40s and 50s with uh, you know, concessions and uh, not not concessions but uh, acceptance of capitalist system that that it really goes back to 1886 when the AFL was formed in opposition to the Knights of Labor, which was yeah a, a grouping based on the solidarity of all working people. The AFL for from day one accepted capitalism and accepted imperialism too, acted in the Pan-American mm -hmm. uh, la labor movement that, you know, to set up accommodationist unions like itself all over Latin America in opposition to the real class struggle based unions that existed there. But, uh, but also, uh, you, know, you talked about the kind of organizing you undertook with just District 65 in New York, yeah, striking for recognition rather than going through the NLRB process and employing direct action in a variety of ways. It, it seemed to me that the labor movement in this country became derailed when it accepted the NLRA in 1935 and, and embraced all of its procedures, which removed like, all, all the, uh, the activity and struggle from the membership into this bureaucratic procedure and 
Yeah, for a few years, while workers were still strong in the aftermath of the 30s organizing, that uh, the, the NLRB gave uh, a lot of crumbs to workers, uh, more crumbs than they uh, had before and more than we get today. But yet, at the time that this was going on, the movement was becoming emasculated, becoming uh, impotent. Uh, the, you know, the, the right to strike over grievances was removed entirely. It just doesn't exist anymore in contracts or in uh, labor law. And th this is really the crux of where we, we've lost our ability to fight back. Do you know that we also have the need that was a, that was a gimmick that we frequently used in the New York, at least in the shops that I was involved with. There would be some kind of real grievance in the shop, and I would get a call from the steward, and I would say, what do you think we ought to do? And the steward would say, well, we ought to stop working. Go ahead. And just sit there until the boss is going to call me, so just sit there. And that would happen. And the boss would call me. Workers are violating the contract. So I would come down, all of this was pretty well understood, and I would get the workers together with the boss there, and I'd say you're in violation of the agreements, and I'm instructing you to go back to work, and they would say, screw you, Pete. <laughs> <laughs> and I would say, get the boss aside, and I'd say, hey, look, they won't even listen to me. I mean, if they're mad, you better do something here. And it's amazing how often and how well this worked. So no strike provisions didn't mean very much. It depends on how much <coughs> strength workers have and how well they understand. And you know, we talk about education. We had this prepared. The editor of the union newspaper has actually prepared it. But we were the ones who had the ideas. Basic union mathematics, negotiation mathematics. And a copy of this was distributed to every shop for workers to study and learn how you negotiate a contract, how you crossed out a contract, how you know what a day sick leave will cost. That was part of educating workers. We also had uh, classes after work in which we taught workers what uh, legal language meant. And that was very important. You know, we had recently an experience where a group of teachers had negotiated an agreement with the school in which they were teaching and asked Dorothea to look it over and see if, uh, if it, you know, was okay. Well, it wasn't. These were teachers, well-educated, but did not understand that legal language is not quite the same as the language you'll find in a novel. One of the things we found out, we saw in several places where they had in this agreement, which the workers wrote, the teachers, management should do the following. Oh, amazing, because should is permissive. It should have been man management shall, not management should. So we also had classes on a regular basis teaching people what le legal language was and how they could develop legal language. We frequently had workers who came to us and said they were having problems with their landlord. And we would tell them, you know how to organize, you learn that process. So go organize. It's amazing how many members we had who became activists mm -hmm. in other areas throughout the city. That was part of the process of education. And that is what has always, I think, been lacking in the labor movement. No, it's the and I think it's lacking yeah. largely 
because it's threatening to the leadership. Yeah. Um, I wonder what you uh, what you would have to say about um, the changing makeup of the working class in this country, shifting more towards retail and, and service jobs, um, and you know how they have, they're notoriously hard to organize um, in those those industries and in those in those contexts because many people, whether or not it's true, feel that they are only going to be there for a short amount of time, or yeah, I mean, it's true that many people bounce from, from job to job 